What's up guys, Ben here bringing you another video today. It is time. I haven't done a Q&A in a while, so I figured we'd run one back. It's been a couple of months, so I tweeted out for some questions. Got a bunch of really good ones in, covering a wide variety of topics from COD to sports to some other stuff. So let's dive in. Let me get you some answers to these burning questions. All right, first up, we have DJ St. Row 69. Can you walk us through the process of getting the flank to live stream from an event? From contacting Activision to the venue, et cetera. Oh, so this one's fun. So I will say, let's talk about in the context of team events, because I generally don't really have have or need to have a lot of Activision conversations um, around this from event to event. Basically what we do is uh, I hit up the event organizer and say, hey, you know, we're interested in coming through. Uh, let's hop on a call and let's get more information about your event, date, space, et cetera. So we, we have that conversation, we get information. I exchange a bunch of emails, kind of give them sort of our needs from internet to power, to furniture, to equipment. I kind of understand um, what they're gonna provide, costs, any logistical issues, load in time, schedules, any other considerations we might have um and then we decide whether we're going to uh, attend the event or maybe um do it in the city around the event due to other reasons like we did at toronto last year um so that all gets get figured out about a month and a half to two months out from an event then it's sort of the phase um equipment side of it we don't really travel actually with that much equipment what we generally do for events they usually source um a, a computer and a pc local for the market that we're in which is usually not as hard as you think it is tvs are generally fairly cheap and oftentimes the event producers will have one for us and then uh pcs we can usually um either get local um from connects or we can rent usually not that expensive on that front uh as well and the rest of our equipment we bring in uh from la we fit it into usually one suitcase and one pelican although i want to move to uh, getting a second pelican this year because those pelicans are very nice like our mixer our camera our headsets, um, keyboard mice, uh, stream decks, tripods, cables, like all that stuff travels with us from event to event. And we don't generally ship stuff to events because I'm very concerned about stuff getting like lost. And and as you know, other people have dealt with in the past, if, if the stuff gets delayed to the weather, you're kind of screwed. So we travel with it, we check in, it's not that expensive uh, in overall cost. And yeah, that's basically how we do it. It doesn't end up being that stressful. I've done it a bunch of times now where I feel like the process is pretty simple. I think the biggest thing for us is just doing an early cost exercise and figuring out if it, it makes sense for us to go to an event or not, just because travel's expensive, hotels are expensive, um, and unless we have a sponsor or a partner or funding to do it, we really don't want to spend uh, out of pocket to attend the event if we don't need to. All right, next up we have Jordan asking the important questions, chicken tenders or chicken nuggets? Yo, I'm gonna be real on this one. I think probably tenders. Listen, I love a good McNugget, don't get me wrong. McDonald's makes a great product there. You get a nice McNugget, uh, a frozen Coke, it's a great combo, but honestly a good chicken tender, like a cane chicken tender, it, it blows a chicken McNugget out of the water or chicken nugget out of the water. I gotta be real. Maybe if I was like seven, I would have said chicken nuggets, but as an adult now, has to be chicken tenders for sure. We got Nick Mo coming in with a pretty deep question here. Would the CDL benefit from a baseball type schedule? For example, phase plays optic for a three game set with the best of five on three separate days. The winner of the series gains an extra 10 points, sweep gains 20 extra points. This way matches could be every day with some teams having off days. I think this is a very interesting idea. I just think this is one of those solutions that are trying to make esports like sports. And I don't think we need to do that. Like I see the thought process here, more content better, more matches better. Uh, the problem with this thought process here is that you're adding more match days. You're not adding more matches on the same match day. You're adding more match days, which is gonna add more broadcast production costs, more staff costs staff up those game day costs for everybody involved you would create more inventory for teams to sell against but i don't think it's going to offset your production issues so i like the idea uh you guys know that i am all for you know maybe increased number of online qualifiers say from seven to last year we don't know what it'll be this year to say 11 so it's a single round robin but i think this one might be a little bit too much an overcorrection again trying to be too much like sports and we don't need to do that i like the creative thinking though w idea no ideas, bad ideas. This one just, I don't think will work in practice. We have two Miami questions coming up here. One from Soldat. How do you see Miami coming in their second season with a full Spanish roster? Do you think they can beat the top six from last season? And we have Rebellions coming with a full season from Real in addition to Rencore. I think Miami is a real shot of being a top four or five team. How faded am I? I think uh, the question for me with Miami is last year they were very inconsistent and that led to a lot of poor results on land and very mixed results online. And I just don't see how that really changes with this game. Um, I think the mid pack of teams have gotten better this year. Um, so it's gonna be really hard and really competitive amongst the top six, eight, 10, 12 teams. Do I think Miami can like steal upsets against the top four teams? I mean, they, they had some nice victory early on the season against Optic. But I'm gonna be real with you. I think they can steal some top six upsets, but, I, I, but being a, a top four or five team, I don't think so. I think I have C9, 
uh, or Toronto likely being ahead of them in that conversation. But you never, never know. Maybe it clicks. Uh, maybe, you know, they figure it out with their existing lineup. Maybe they bring Rencore in. I don't know. Um, I just need to see more from Miami as far as consistent results before I really think the capable of taking the next step as a team. I just think it's going to be more of the same this year. All right, we got double XP. I think making a Trump joke here. Do you think the CDL administration needs a new face capitalizing F like Trump? New blood that understands the niche ecosystem and can balance pros, casuals, and the financial bottom line. That's the question. I, I think the key question that I have for folks at CDL, folks at uh, ESL Facebook Group is, you know, like what is Call of Duty competitive look like going forward? Because I feel like, you know, it is stuck a little bit in neutral. I think there's a lot of interest in the scene. I think there is a lot of diversification of content. I think this new generation of pro, they're starting to create more content um, and kind of really establish a personality. So you're really starting to have that nice transition. And we've seen that event attendance was very good last year. And I think looking at the potential cities we're going to in Barcelona, in Chicago, Toronto, Dallas, like I think all these events are going to be packed. But my question is like, what is the next year of CDL look like beyond this year? Does it even exist? Is it the CWL? Are we going back to open events? Um, I do think we are getting to a point where I think we need to shuffle things up. And, and ideally, we don't run back to YouTube deal. Um, but I think we'll be answering many of these questions and kind of exploring what comes out uh, in the coming days and weeks, probably on the flank a lot over the course of the next season. All right, we got my guy Matt coming in with a fun question. Best in-person sporting event memory. I, I think obviously some great events that I've watched um, on television, like um, the two... Giants Super Bowl wins, which both had um, insane moments. Watch some insane Champions League games. The Kyrie buzz, uh, the the uh, Kawhi buzzer beater was great. Uh, game seven NBA Finals, great. I think for me, a couple of really good college football games. Kick six, uh, Alabama Auburn. That, that was wild. I think best event that I've been to in person, best event memory is I went to the 2012 or 2012 ALDS Game Three, uh, Yankees uh, versus the Orioles, I believe was in the game. I, uh, 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 yeah, I think I'm pretty sure it was the Orioles. And Rollo Bynes had one of the most insane like stretches of three innings I've ever seen at the end of a game. The Yankees were uh, down 2-1 in the ninth inning and Abanez had a home run to tie the game and then hit an Ab and then hit a home run in uh, extra innings to walk off the game. That was probably the best in-person experience I've had at a sporting event. Too bad the Yankees have still not won a World Series since then, but you know, at least I have that memory. All right, let's keep it moving and grooving. Alex comes in with this. Hear me out, a CDL rookie draft. Currently, there's no incentive to build towards the future like traditional sports. Everything in the CDL is win now mode. What if the worst teams in the league would get first dibs and own the rights of incoming rookies? I think this is a terrible idea. Again, we're trying to be like professional sports. Almost every league I've ever seen at, aka MLS, that has discovery rights. Um, the NHL is another example of this with how the uh, NHL entry draft works for players that are like four or five years out of the, N uh, the NHL. I just don't think it works in practice. I think promising rookies and promising talent will always get chances. There's a weird thread, I think, amongst fans that like not enough rookies, young players get a chance. I think they do. I think we're currently in a little bit of a talent lull, although there are some very promising 18 or 19 year old players that I think will break out this year and we'll probably end up on teams by the middle of the year. But I don't think we need all of this to get rookies in the league. We've had plenty. Go look at the teams and go see how many players have uh, 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 just broken through in the last two or three years and you'll be surprised at the number there. All right, Kobe with a pretty common question, but one that we haven't checked in on in a while. What teams outside the top three will be a dark horse team going into the events? So I did this tier list a while back and I think reflecting on it now, um, looking at the list at the middle six in this list, I think Cloud9 Toronto are probably the two favorites I have to really be a dark horse to win the event. I just don't think that Carolina or Vancouver or General Mates or Miami have the firepower, although some of those teams have upsides to make a top three or top four. I think the only teams that realistically like below, below the bottom three that I think could actually like legitimately win a tournament if everything goes right. You've got Toronto players who have a mix of either won a tournament or made a final in the last year. The same for players on Cloud9, or including players that have also won one historically throughout their careers. Those are two. I think everybody else, I think, is on the next tier. And I probably should run back this tier list uh, at some point later on this month. I haven't you know, looked at it in a while. All right, Killzoid. What players or players have you been most impressed by early on in Black Ops 6? Uh, I think for me, obviously, everybody on the top teams is looking pretty good. I think actually a couple of players that have surprised me at how well they played. I think Austin, Lidicote Slash has actually played pretty good. I think Geo's uh, played particularly well. I think Real's played uh, particularly well. I think Gwyn's played particularly well. It is early though, but I think a lot of these like, you know, takeover Slayer types that we saw at times last year have looked pretty good 
in this game, especially players that are more of a flexor or main AR type. Uh, it's just been really hard for sub players, but I noticed yesterday watching the tournaments of sub players really starting to feel comfortable in the routes and setups on some of these maps. Red card is a map where they're you know still struggling due to the routes, but I, I think um, those are the players outside the top players that really surprised me, and we'll see if it holds as people start to learn the game over the next few weeks. All right, my guy MJ United, tough soccer team to support these days. Uh, coming in with this one. How do you see the league playing out this year with the with the top teams? I think is what he meant. Being phased off the only team. What are you expecting from the other teams? I'm expecting a little bit more competition this year from the mid pack teams. I think of the way that this game plays in the map set early, I think there will be a number of upsets, and I don't think that we're going to see as crazy of a top end percentage uh, amongst the bottom eight as we did uh, last year. I think it'll it'll even out a little bit more. I think it's really a case of will two or three teams kind of crack through and really test these top three teams. I think it's definitely possible with the way that this game plays out early um, this year. Will it hold by the end of the year? I don't know, but you know, going back to the earlier question, I think Toronto and Cloud9 are two teams I expect to maybe round out of the top five. And then it's gonna be very competitive below that with especially the rumor of the league format with the online tournaments um, and all of that. Um, I'm expecting a full fight this year. All right, Dyslexic Gamer, MJ or LeBron? Listen, I grew up on like the tail end of the MJ era. He's obviously goaded. I think what LeBron is doing uh, in his career is unprecedented. The amount of years of service that he has in the NBA and the production, like this guy's longevity, the level that he's playing out and the fact that the Lakers look really good this year and actually I think may factor in the West. To me, I think LeBron wins this one, to be honest. All right, Swampy Bandit asked an interesting question. Why did you stop the podcast with Crowder? That was great. Uh, I think short answer is Chris just didn't want to do the show anymore. He wanted to focus on coaching and kind of his other stuff. I am going to be running up a new podcast. I'll talk more about it in my next video. And I'm talking to Chris whether or not I can borrow um, Scrap Time or use Scrap Time for the name of that show. Uh, but basically, Chris didn't want to do the show anymore. And, and I, I think it's just probably still on that unless he kind of has a change of mind on that front. All right, we got a couple of questions left. Nate comes in. Little Nate. Little Nate. Little Nate. Little Nate. Anyway. Can his case on 1v1 come to fruition, Sir Benji and his team? No one's ever called me Sir Benji. Yeah, I think I'm going to 1v1 Kaysan at some point this year. I watched his, his gameplay this last weekend, and uh, I think I could take him on that front. So some more to come there. I think him and I, I'm going to talk to him when I go to LA this weekend. We'll see what we can do. And we got Murder Clubster with a really, I'm trying to understand what this question is, I think. If not a player, what other roles in COD can you achieve as a career, not as a coach as well? So I think he's asking, uh, like, if you didn't want to be a player, like, what else can you do in this scene? I think there's a couple of other uh, important roles. One is obviously other front office roles help manage the competitiveness of a team right gm coach analyst like there's a lot on that front you don't need to be a player to fill those roles if you're talented have a good eye for the game good organization etc i think there's always teams in the league need back office people to handle marketing to handle finance to handle uh, broadcast production to handle stage production um, to handle competitive operation so i think depending on whatever your interests are in your career there probably is an esport job attached to it um, so, uh, that would, that'd be my advice is like, you don't have to be a player to get into this career. There's a lot of different uh, things you can do. And I think it really just comes down to like, what are you passionate about as a sub sub a sub subject? And then how that applies to esports is like generally pretty straightforward to figure out. All right. Last question from swarm merchant. I like him with the nice little Texans, uh, helmet there. I thought the Texans really struggling this year. Offensive line kind of buns. Describe your thought process. When you take a Ben J route, the people need to learn from the greatest cod mine ever. I'm going to be honest with you. We talking about the Karachi riot route. There was literally no thought going on my brain, full smooth brain thought process thinking I can jump out the map, jump over that stupid wall. There's really none. There's no thought process. Absolute just like, you know, just smash in forward on my left stick, not thinking. All right, so that'll do it for today's q and appreciate all the questions. Let me know in the comments you guys thought of the video. Like if you enjoyed, subscribe for more as always, guys. We'll see you on the next one.